Would it shock you to learn that Anthony Albanese and the ALP have been accused of a betrayal of trust and of an active betrayal? Well, me neither. But this time, it's over something a little bit different. It's over the plans to remove protections for faith-based schools. And religious institutions are not happy. Religious institutions seem to believe that because they went along with some of the ALP's proposals, they now should have some reciprocity. The ALP should perhaps now not go after them with the attacks on faith-based schools. However, that loyalty is not to be repaid. And this of course would not be the first time that Anthony Albanese has betrayed a group whose support he was counting on, but is now deemed to be unnecessary. Just think for example of the recent Stage 3 tax cut backflip, and the associated tax hike, which came through reversing previously legislated tax cuts. Then there's the superannuation tax grab, even though he had said that he would not be increasing taxes on superannuation, and even though he had said he would not be going back on Stage 3 tax cuts, and said he would go through with them in full. Then we've got the industrial relations laws. The list keeps going on. Anthony Albanese has thrown many people under the bus even after assuaging their fears that that would not be the case. But now we have faith-based schools in the firing line. So what exactly triggered this latest incident? Well, the impetus was an Australian Law from Commission report into whether and when religious schools could or should discriminate against people on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, and other factors. This report was propelled by the ALP as part of a promise to protect LGBTQ students. And it also came part of a promise to reduce religious discrimination and to bring in anti-religious discrimination policies. However, the government is really focused on the first part of this. They've really focused on preventing faith-based institutions from discriminating against LGBTQ individuals on the basis of their faith. The ALP is clearly more concerned with one of these issues than the other. The ALP has seemingly made very little in the way of moves to reduce religious discrimination or to bring in a religious freedom bill as they said they were going to do. Now the coalition has been understandably cautious about these changes. They've demanded details and a Senate inquiry into what these changes would mean. They've demanded they would go through the proper process. This of course has led the ALP to accuse the coalition of failing to engage in bipartisanship, as if bipartisanship should just be the default position, and the opposition party should just lay down and accept whatever the ALP puts up. By contrast, one would think the opposition, if they're actually doing their job, would hold the government to account. But nevertheless, this has caused the ALP to consider negotiating with the Greens, whose positions have been rather anti-religious, or at least rather anti-Christian and anti-Jewish, it appears from their recent statements. Now back to the report and the potential changes. Well, the terms of reference for the ALRC report were as follows. I, the Honourable Mark Dreyfus, Attorney General of Australia, having regard to the government's commitment to amend the Sex Discrimination Act and other federal anti-discrimination laws, including the Fair Work Act, to ensure that an educational institution conducted in accordance with the doctrines, tends beliefs and teachings of a particular religion or creed, one, must not discriminate against a student on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, marital or relationship status, or pregnancy. Two, must not discriminate against a member of staff on those matters. And third, can continue to build a community of faith by giving preference in good faith to persons of the same religion as the educational institution in the selection of staff. In essence, the terms of reference behind this report were to remove religious exemptions to various laws. Notably, the focus here is on stopping alleged discrimination by religious institutions. The ALRC was not tasked with trying to stop discrimination against religious individuals or against religious institutions. Now, the main recommendations coming from the ALRC were to remove exemptions to the Sex Discrimination Act that would have allowed religious institutions to expel LGBTQ students, for example, or to discriminate against prospective employees on the basis of their gender identity or sexual orientation or other matters. The core recommendation here was to repeal Section 38 of the Sex Discrimination Act and to amend some other sections of that act and that would have a similar and additional effect to repealing Section 38. Now this was spelled out in a rather long report. I'll just go through the high-level summary of this. 
So Section 38 of the Sex Discrimination Act provides exemptions to religious educational institutions in relation to the sex discrimination laws. It basically says nothing in the foregoing paragraphs that would prevent discrimination render it unlawful for a person to discriminate against another person on the ground of their sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, marital or religious status, or pregnancy in connection with the employment as a member of staff of an educational institution that is conducted in accordance with the doctrines, tenets, beliefs, or teachings of a particular religion or creed if the first mentioned person so discriminates in good faith in order to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherents of that religion or creed. In essence, it allowed educational institutions to discriminate if that discrimination was necessary or at least done in good faith to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherents to that religion, i.e. it would enable religious schools to, in theory, potentially expel some LGBTQ students. However, it's not clear how often does this happen in practice, and it's not clear at all that in this day and age, they could actually legally expel all LGBTQ students unless they were really actively advocating in a manner that was contrary to the religion. But in any case, this section would have provided exemptions to the prohibition on various types of discrimination. In the other proposed amendments under the ALRC report, sections 23 and 37 would have been amended to remove exemptions to the anti-discrimination provisions in relation to accommodation and some other areas that would have applied to educational institutions. In short, the effect would have been to reduce the ability of religious schools to discriminate in accordance with their religious beliefs. Now, there are probably thoughts either way about whether they should be able to discriminate in that manner, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. It is a rather vexed issue. For example, if someone is going around actively attacking a particular religion, then potentially they could be expelled or potentially not employed by that religion. However, of course, it is a matter of degree, and one needs to consider what is the sensible limit on the allowable discrimination that can go on. And that to some extent is what this report is trying to do. Now, the problem is not per se with trying to prevent the discrimination in this area. Rather, the problem apparently is the lack of consultation with religious institutions. It's been reported that Anthony Albanese and the ALP have both A, enveloped this whole process in secrecy, and also B, have failed to consult with major religious leaders. Reportedly, for example, they failed to consult with Archbishop Anthony Fisher of the Catholic Church in Sydney. At least that's what has been reported in parts of the media. Well, if Albanese is so paranoid that he doesn't trust his own MPs, well, look at how he's treating business leaders, forcing them to sign NDAs. Confidenti confidentiality agreements have now become very common under Labor for everything from Tony Burke's workplace laws to Chris Bowen's car efficiency proposals even to religious leaders over the religious freedom legislation. NDAs are usually used to protect sensitive information, and they've rarely, if ever, been used by governments when discussing policy with stakeholders, with the exception of occasional national security matters. Political veteran Dennis Shanahan writes that the government's ubiquitous use of non-disclosure agreements to gag organisations and keep proposed legislation secret is a travesty of Albanese's pre-election promise of transparency and a corruption of the Rudd government's original intent. It's the antithesis of Albanese's pledge from the opposition benches to operate with transparency and accountability if he became PM. Well, it's this broken promise on transparency that's most eroding trust in Labor. And then on religious discrimination laws, well, Anthony Albanese stood outside a church in July 2022 and he promised there'd be wide consultation. Given that we're outside the church today, what is your message? What are you going to be doing for them? Uh, that I respect people of faith. Uh, we will address uh, the issues of religious discrimination and the need to legislate there. Uh, we will do that during the term of Parliament. We'll do it in a way uh, which is uh, much more consultative and brings people together in, in a way that I, I hope characterises the way that my government functions. Oh, that's a farce. 
much more consultative and brings people together. Yet instead of seeing wide consultation or any consultation, some religious leaders like Archbishop Anthony Fisher haven't been consulted at all, while others have been asked to sign NDAs. Well, what does it say about the Prime Minister that he's broken a commitment he made outside of a church? I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that. But if the government can't trust religious leaders to look at legislation, then Labor really has hit rock bottom. What this means is the key stakeholders that would actually be affected by these amendments have simply not been consulted at all. And this means that while Anthony Albanese likes to talk about the idea of giving a voice to the people affected by legislation, that seems to be only the case when it suits him. When it doesn't suit him, he seems to be quite willing to steamroll over anyone who is a detractor. And if he's not consulting, then maybe he's not going to end up with the most informed provisions here. Furthermore, it's been reported that when there has been consultation, the people have been forced to sign non-disclosure agreements, which effectively would prevent them from speaking to their own other stakeholders in the organisation to come up with a more fully informed decision. In essence, the whole process has been shrouded in secrecy and has failed to consider the impact of the legislation on the various institutions it would actually affect. That really is what the underlying act of betrayal is. Not per se that they are looking at removing some of these exemptions, but rather it is the process involved in doing so. Now, like I've said, there may or may not be some grounds for some tweaking of these pieces of legislation. The reasonable minds can differ on that. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about that. But I can also see why a school might want to be able to remove someone if they're actively advocating against that particular religion or creed, or is doing things that are aggressively antagonistic toward that religion, or aggressively go against that religion's tenets in a very overt and dogmatic manner. So there really is a matter of degree about how far any exemptions, if any, should actually be applied. But in any case, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about the process and about the proposed removals in the comments below. And otherwise, thanks a lot for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, and hopefully I see you next time as well.